Hello, everyone. Uh, since Irina Malenchuk does not seem to be here, and Limer, Lynn Remoswell, the next presenter, seems to be ready, we will proceed. Uh, they will present, Lynn Remoswell will present First Step AI, a case study of a client application of AI. Lynn, can you hear us? I can, loud and clear. Okay. Can you share your screen? Cool. Thank you very much. I just started. Can you see uh, that? Yes, we can see perfectly fine. Are you ready to present? I am, yes. Well, welcome and have it. How about it, please? Thank you very much. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Lane Remelswell. Um, I've previously published in the, the Beaker Conference in 2020, and it's a pleasure to be invited back to give a a case study talk about Cape Ray, a medical application of artificial intelligence. Um, before I start, can I just see how many people are in the audience? I see there's 15 people on the Zoom call. Can I get a sense of how many people are in the room in person? We have about 30 people here. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to give a real-world case study, um, and I'm glad to have been invited to, to give this. My background is machine learning. I'm a PhD candidate at the moment, and I'm also a machine learning consultant for a company called FirstStep.ai. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that case study, the problem that Cape Ray had, and how we were able to provide them with a solution. Looking forward to engaging with the audience if there's any questions. And uh, yeah, without any further, let me jump right in. To give a little bit of a background on Cape Ray. Cape Ray is a technology company. They produce both hardware and software. They're based in South Africa on the other side of the world. And they produce a number of different machines, including this one here called the Aseco, or Akeso. And they specialize in digital mammography. So X-rays and ultrasound, it's a combined X-ray and ultrasound in one device. So it's quite a unique device. And they take medical images of the breast. In terms of how they take that image, they take slices of images as their scanner goes across from left to right. And so you get both the the, the width and the depth, and they take 235 slices, each one millimeter apart. So that's what we're dealing with here. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like once you try to recreate it in a three-dimensional form. So you can see there is the shape of the breast on the plate. There's a top plate and a bottom plate, which kind of squashes it in order to let the ultrasound do what it needs to do. And it takes slices, as you can see in this visualization. And in order to really dive into how we applied machine learning, I'm going to take a single slice and I'm going to talk about that single slice. So that's what we're looking at here. It's a single slice, a cross section of that three dimensional representation. All right, so let me take a little bit of time just orientating you around this because this is really the problem that was presented and the problem we try to solve and we managed to solve with artificial intelligence. So what you'll see here is there's quite a lot happening on the screen. Most of this is actually noise and echo. With the ultrasound, the tricky thing is that ultrasound works well if there are solids or liquids. As soon as it reaches air and there's any exposure to air, you start getting strange echoes. So if we have a look at this image here, what I've highlighted in green is the actual breast tissue that the client wanted to capture. You can see right at the top of the image, this is the scanning plate. There's a fixed width across. There's a, a few millimeters of plate. Everything on the right-hand side here is an echo that is created by the fact that there was air. And as a result, you have this echo that permeates through from all the way across the image. At the top of the breast here as well, you'll see that there's an additional echo and Everything outside of that green area is what the client wanted to remove from the image. Because they want to hand this image across to a medical technician 
and that medical technician wanted to do some evaluation on it, but all this noise was getting in the way, which is an interesting application for medical AI, because quite often medical AI is considered a diagnostic tool where you give it a, an image and it tells you what is wrong with the image or what the diagnosis is. In this case, we were asked to apply AI to clean up the image to allow the technician to make a more informed decision. So that is the context here. So you can see there's quite a lot happening. We've got echoes on the right-hand side, we've got dead space at the bottom, and we've also got some echoes that come into the middle of the image, which they wanted to remove. So it's quite a complex problem. And what we then used in this case was the firststep.ai design tool. So firststep.ai, they provide a fantastic design tool in short, what you can do is it focuses on visual AI, you upload your data set, you can do some annotations, you can train your model, and you can then deploy it or process images using that model. And the really nice thing about it is it's leveraging all of this great AI technology, but it provides it in a no code environment and it's designed for non-developers. So there's a really nice wrapping around it that makes it really easy for non-developers to access it and get quick results. We were able to, well, currently we're able to deploy POC models to various different clients in a matter of two or three hours from start to finish. To give you an idea of the sort of AI that we have in terms of the toolkit and what we had to choose from to try to solve this problem, we had a range of image classification, object detection, object segmentation, pose estimation, 3D reconstruction, and time series forecasting. These are the tools that we had at our disposal. If we then have a look at what each of these are, I know we've got quite a lot of AI experts in the audience. So I apologize if this is something that is very familiar to everyone. And I've been listening to the talks for the last few hours as well. And I can see there's a lot of interest in different types of AI. But to give you an idea of how image classification detection and segmentation apply to medical imaging, here's another example from another client where we have a fetal scan. In image classification, it uh, yeah, image classification would allow you to look at that image and tell you whether there was a fetus there or not, whether this person is pregnant or not. So it's more of a yes, no, applying AI to the entire image. Object detection is one step further. It identifies with a bounding box where in the image the object of interest is. Taking it a step further, even more complex, you get object segmentation which quite simply creates a polygon around the object of interest so that you're able to analyze the shape, size, characteristics of that object. So these are the tools very easily we had available to us. And in this case, we're trying to solve this client's problem. We chose to use object segmentation because we really wanted to get down, not just whether something was there, whether there was echoes, but actually trying to isolate those individual echoes. So of the suite of, of tools we had, we chose object segmentation. We uploaded a number of images. I think we use about 50 images for this, a very small data set. It's got incredible results. What we then did was use the first step design tool to simply annotate using the object segmentation annotation tool. Very easy, you can zoom in and out, you can click and it automatically saves. You just switch across to the next image and instead of doing this in a third party tool and uploading the results, all of this is just built in. We then have a wonderful, well, the first step designer has a wonderful one click training mechanism. You can literally click a single button and it does all the training for you. It tries to calculate what the optimal augmentation should be, all the fine tuning, as well as what your base parameter or your base model should be. And I'll dive a little bit more detail into the base model just now and how that works. But for this case, a PyTorch model was chosen and used a combination of faster RCNN and mask RCNN to do the detection and the segmentation. Okay, what exactly is happening? And so most of you in the audience are probably quite aware of how convolutional neural networks work, but just, I've got three slides here. I just wanted to touch on it for those of you who aren't quite sure how it works and why they're so powerful. What a CNN does is it takes an image, and I'm talking about visual CNNs over here, or image CNNs. It has multiple layers inside the CNN. And what it effectively does is it starts 
building up that image slowly. It, the first layer is a level of feature extraction. So it identifies smaller features within the image, everything from a line to a curve to a dark area, colors, and it combines those features at the next level called the classification level. And combinations of smaller features result in larger objects. So it starts to build up a concept from small features. So in this case here, take the sum of the small features and the sum of the small features combined will be considered a motorbike. So there's a feature extraction layer and the classification layer. The really nice thing about CNNs is you can use something called transfer learning, meaning that you can start with a pre-trained CNN and with object detection, I think this is an object detection screenshot, but you can choose from lots of different base CNNs that have been pre-trained on dozens of millions of images. And a pre-trained model applied to an image can give you something like I've shown you on the right-hand side here. You can identify cars, people, trees, a number of standard objects. To give you an idea of the COCO train models, COCO is a it's data set with 90 labels, nine zero. So it's trained across 90 different objects, common objects, everything from a beer bottle to a tree, to a person, to a car, common objects that you would see. And there are lots of other different types of models as well that you can choose from. And why transfer learning is so important is because you start with a base model and all those features that have already been built into that model that have been trained, it knows what a corner looks like, it knows what a circle looks like, it knows what a dark area looks like, and broken it down into features, those are preserved. It's only the classification layer which is retrained, meaning that sums of features in different combinations, you can then choose what to label that. So in this case, We've used a PyTorch model to solve this particular object segmentation model or some object segmentation problem. And the base model had been pre-trained on medical images. And we said, we are interested in echoes. And that is what we used and retrained in the classification layer. So after choosing that, it quite literally is a one-click training. And in the first step designer, these just pop up underneath each other, some of them quicker, some of them a bit slower. You can see the results, you can see the framework used, you can see how many epochs it ran. And at the end here, if you wanna dive in and you want to write or dive into exactly what's happening underneath the hood, you can click on it and you can get more detail about what is actually happening in terms of the loss, the MAP scores. So if you want to dive in, and really understand why the best model was chosen and when it was chosen, there is that option as well. So it's designed for non-developers, but developers do get insight into what's happening underneath the hood with this toolkit. At the end, you then choose how you want to deploy your model. Do you want to deploy your object detection, object segmentation model on a mobile app? Do you want to deploy it to an edge IoT device? Or do you want to deploy it to a cloud server? And this particular client chose a cloud server they post process these images. So let's have a look at what's happening. These are the results. This is what we all wanna see. How well did we do with identifying echoes using object segmentation? This is the image right at the beginning, the before image. Object segmentation successfully managed to remove or identify, we were then able to remove. So it identified the echoes very comfortably across these images. This is a very small data set. We were able to extend it in a future version of this project. Um, but in this initial project that I'm showing you now, it was only an image data set of about 50 images and we've got fantastic results. On top of that, there's a second part of it, which it was able to remove echoes delicately from inside the tissue, not just on the edge. The way we removed those as well was quite clever. We had to do something in order to remove those without leaving dark spaces, but that's not the focus of this talk right now. I'm just having a look at how we managed to identify those regions. The third step was then to identify the boundary at the bottom and then remove everything from below that. And so just applying this object segmentation to this image, the final result looks something like this, where we had nice dark space at the bottom. We didn't directly remove the echoes on the side, we actually muted them. We reduced the intensity down to about 10%. So in case there's something of interest there, at least some of those features are preserved, not entirely removed. And in a future version, we actually managed to enhance what happened inside the tissue as well. We didn't just leave dark lines in the tissue. 
um, but that is using some other technology and not object segmentation. So this is the beautiful final version of it. And the client was able to use this and this provided the technician with significantly cleaner images to analyze. And this is just a great application we found of how to use AI in medical imaging to clean up the image and not just for diagnostic purposes. How do you guys get access to this? If you guys were interested in this kind of tool and you would like to use it in any of your work, you guys are welcome to sign up. It's easy to sign up. You can sign up as a student. Our, the simple philosophy of firststep.ai is not one of these where you have to pay to have access to all of the features. You get access to all of the features up front. You can design any project you want. All of the different models are at your disposal. It's free to design. Only when you want to deploy it to a production environment, only at that point do you pay. So if you're deploying this to a medical client yourself, at that point, there'd be a paywall. But if you want to design it, run simulations, run images through it, all of that is free of charge from a, an academic perspective. To add to this, we've been working with the Beaker Conference as well to provide the best paper for the Beaker 2022 conference. We'll get access to six months for a full professional license where you can deploy this to any final production system. So really looking forward to seeing who gets awarded the best paper and hopefully working with that person uh, to build some really amazing models and get a chance to test out some of these new features. And so that's just the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? And thank you everyone for listening. Sorry, thank you very much, Lynn, for your presentation. Uh, we have a question here in person. Hi, Lynn. Uh, Hi there. In your, in, your, uh, in your version of the best, uh, can, can you come back to the best uh, image that you got? Uh, are you talking yeah. about the final? No, not this one, not this one, the, the, the final process, well, yeah, this one, the final result. Well, in, in this uh, image, we still see some stripes there. Um, what is the difficulty of, of trying to uh, not having these stripes or if these stripes are some kind of noise or if they are uh, a result of uh, problems in the processing of suppressing the, the, the noise? What, what is the reason for these stripes being still there? Are you talking about the stripes in the image here that are not necessarily horizontal? Are you talking about the ones that are curved? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the horizontal um, stripes. Are you talking about the horizontal ones, the dark lines? Yeah, the, the, the black ones. Yes, so the black ones, in this case here, we used object segmentation as the first step to identify where those lines were. The final version we deployed on the clients actually used it, took it a step further and said, how do we remove those lines from the, from the tissue, which are right in the middle here, and not leaving these dark lines streaked through the image? And what we did was an interesting combination of interpolation from what the, the image, the pixel directly above it and the pixel directly below it would be. And we effectively faded it in order to take the average of what was what would be behind that stripe. I don't have one of those final images to show you, unfortunately, today, because this image just focuses on what we did with the object segmentation. But, but, but don't you think that it would be possible some kind of interpolation and in trying to uh, fill up the, the, the black uh, uh, dots and, and try to give a more realistic uh, final result? Instead yes, that would just definitely the, 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 the parts that uh, were uh, uh, diagnosed as, as, as noise. So finding more, so blacking them out like we've done in this particular image, you're right, is, is not the best way of presenting this in the final state to the technician. We do need to figure out what is behind those echoes. In some cases, as you'll see a little bit further down, there's non-horizontal lines, which are like going in, in curves. These are actually part of the fibrous tissue inside the breast. So we had to be very careful not to remove those and only identify the horizontal lines, which were characteristic of the echo. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. It's a great question. Does anyone else have a question? We still have four minutes left. Well, uh, maybe I can ask about the last part. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Lynn, what you offer for uh, what our our prize winners, uh, like what sort of the deployment would it be, and what are they be able? Would they be able to do uh, that is not available to any? Uh, participant that does not pay for, for a subscription to your services. Absolutely. All right. So designing an AI model, any of the students can do free of charge. It is no cost to designing it, adding images, creating the best model that you can. If you want to take it out of the system and you want to put it, let's say, on a mobile app in order to be able to walk around and use this, we've just done this last week with a farmer. They wanted to take uh, photos of their uh, produce and analyze how many objects there were. It was counting fruit and fruit trees, and they wanted to have it handheld. They want to be able to walk around the mobile app. And so we're able to build mobile apps like that from templates. Uh, it takes about two minutes to build an app using your model. So if you want to take it out and use it in a practical setting, I think mobile would probably be the easiest, whether it's detecting license plates and vehicles as they're driving past, or whether it's detecting fruit for farmers, the professional license will allow you that option to download it onto a mobile device and use it practically. Mm -hmm. And that includes Android and iPhone, I guess, right? IOS. Um, at the moment, Android is supported. Yes, Android is the primary platform supported. And iOS? Uh, not iOS at the moment, but that is coming soon. I see. Um, so again, what, uh, which part of this work will be done by the student and which part by your company? I understand that the student designs the model. What does it mean just to, to write the, the algorithm, the, the code, or what, what, what is the requirement for this model so, so that you can deploy it? Absolutely. In order to design a model, what it is is you come up with an idea, say, I'd like to do object detection, object segmentation. You have a problem that you bring. If you have those images, especially if it's a visual one, if you have images, you'll upload those images, annotate those images, train a new model with a one-click button, and that will then have your model trained. The system takes care of all of the back-end choices and, some, and all of the fine-tuning that needs to happen. So we've had students come and within an hour or two have a model beautifully trained that does something for their particular problem. Mm -hmm. And it can be used then on any iPhone, on any Android phone, or? With a professional license, any Android phone, yes. Your Android phone that you have in your pocket, you can deploy it on that and demo it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I guess we will learn more details in one-on-one -on -one conversation then. Thank you. It's a real pleasure. You're welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions. Pleasure meeting you. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, they have another question, but unfortunately, we're a little short on time because, uh, okay. if I recall right, 